Sermon 46 of Exodus, from Hari Homiletiki by Charles Simeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Repentance of the Israelites. Exodus 33, verses 5 and 6. Therefore now put off thy ornaments from thee, that I may know what to do unto thee. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Horeb. That which is principally required of ministers is fidelity, to dispense the word of God aright without courting the applause of men or fearing their displeasure. Of hearers it is required that they receive the word of God with all readiness of mind, and obey it without reserve. Where such ministers and such people are, happy will they be in each other, and happy also in their God. Of the description we have mentioned was Moses, but not so the people of Israel, they were stiff-necked and rebellious throughout the whole course of his ministry among them. On some few occasions, however, they seemed to be of a better mind, particularly on the occasion now before us. Moses had declared to them a message from God in which their true character was drawn, and his judgments against them were awfully denounced, and the effect, for the present at least, was such as was reasonably to be expected. They trembled at the divine judgments and humbled themselves instantly in the mode prescribed, this is declared in the text, for the elucidating of which we observe, first, God is not able to exercise mercy towards an impenitent transgressor. God certainly is rich in mercy and delights in the exercise of it, and would gladly manifest it towards all the human race. But impenitence presents an insurmountable obstacle in his way, so that he cannot show mercy towards any who abide in it. He cannot, one, because it would be inconsistent with his own perfections. He is a God of inflexible justice, unspotted holiness, and inviolable truth. But what evidence would there be that any of these perfections belonged to him, if he, in direct opposition to his own most positive declarations, put no difference between the proud contemner of his authority and the humble repenting suppliant? Two, because it would be ineffectual for the happiness of the persons themselves. Annihilation, indeed, would be a benefit, if that were granted to them, because... They would then be rescued from the sufferings that await them, but to raise them to heaven would be no source of happiness to them. Having still a carnal mind which is enmity against God, they must hate him, though in heaven, either God or they must change before they can have fellowship with each other. As little comfort could they find in the society or employment of the heavenly hosts. The glorified saints and angels could not unite with those who had no one sentiment or feeling in unison with their own, nor would they, who hate the exercises of prayer and praise in this world, find any satisfaction in such exercises in the world above. I say therefore again that, to an impenitent sinner, heaven would be no heaven, for while sin reigns within him, he has a hell in his own bosom, and carries it with him wheresoever he goes. 3. It would introduce disorder into the whole universe. What sensations must it occasion in heaven? For, if God can so change his very nature as to love an unholy creature, who can tell but that he may go one step further and hate an holy one? As for the effect of it on earth, no one from that moment would either hate or fear sin, not hate it because they would see that God does not hate it, and not fear it because they would see that he will not punish it. Even in hell the effect of it would be felt, for, if God takes an impenitent man to his bosom, why may he not an impenitent spirit also, and what hinders but that the fallen angels may yet become as happy as those who never fell? Could such a thought as this be cherished in that place of torment, hell would from that moment cease to be the place it is. Here then is ample reason why God, notwithstanding his delight in mercy, cannot find how to exercise it towards impenitent sinners. But second, where humiliation is manifested, mercy may be expected. This appears... 1. From the very mode in which repentance is here enjoined. When we speak of God as embarrassed in his mind, or perplexed in his counsels, we must not be understood to intimate that such things actually exist, for known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world, nor can any occasion possibly arise wherein he can be at a loss how to act. But he is pleased to speak in this kind of language respecting himself, in order to accommodate himself to our feeble apprehensions. Put off thy ornaments, that I may know what to do unto thee. Thus, in various other places, he speaks as perplexed in his mind about the line of conduct he shall pursue, and as wishing to show mercy, but not knowing how to do it consistently with his own honour. Let us not then be misunderstood as though in accommodating ourselves to the language of our text we deviated at all from that reverence which is due to the Supreme Being. 
It is here intimated, then, that, whilst impenitence continues, he knows not how to exercise mercy to the sinner, but it is also intimated that when one's persons are humbled for their wickedness, he is at no loss at all how to act towards them. He can then give full scope to the merciful disposition of his own heart, and can pour out all his benefits upon them without any dishonour to his own name. Yes, that point attained, the law is honoured by the sinner himself, the atoning blood of Christ may be applied freely to cleanse him from his guilt, the mercy vouchsafed to him will not be abused, the heavenly hosts will be made to shout for joy, and God himself will be glorified to all eternity. There is no obstacle whatever to the freest and fullest exercise of love towards such a being, and therefore God knows both what to do and how to do it to the best effect. 2. From the experience of penitence in all ages. Look at those in our text. God had threatened that he would go with them no more, but commit them to the guidance of a created angel. This had produced upon them a very deep impression. The fear of being deserted by him had wrought more powerfully upon them than the slaughter of three thousand of their number on the day before. They humbled themselves in the way that God had commanded, and behold, the mercy so ardently desired by them, and by Moses, was granted. My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Look at all other penitents from the foundation of the world. Was ever so much as one spurned from the footstool of divine grace? Was ever one sent empty away? Even where the repentance was far from genuine, considerable respect was paid to it, and the blessing sought for was bestowed. How much more where the repentance itself has been deep, and the contrition manifest? Not even the greatest accumulation of guilt that ever was known was suffered to outweigh the tears of penitence, or to shut up the tender mercies of our God from a contrite soul. The Saviour was sent into the world for the very purpose of saving them that are lost, and he assures all who are weary and heavy laden with a sense of their sins that, on coming to him, they shall find rest unto their souls. Application 1. Consider what obstructions you have laid in the way of your own happiness. Had you not sinned, or after your sins, continued impenitent, you would have been happy long since in the enjoyment of your God. He has been long waiting to be gracious unto you, but you would not suffer him to be so. He has been longing to gather you, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, but you would not. Say then, what alternative is left to God? He has called, but you have refused. He still calls, and you still continue to reject his counsels. Truly, he knows not what to do. If he spare you, you only add sin to sin, and if he cut you off, you perish without the smallest hope of mercy. Who can tell but that he is deliberating at this moment, and just about to form his ultimate decision? Who can tell but that this very night he may determine, as he did respecting his people of old, go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard, I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, I will tread down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. Or, as he elsewhere says, I swear in my wrath that they shall never enter into my rest. Know, beloved, that if this calamity fall upon you, the fold is utterly your own. Nothing but iniquity can separate between you and your God. Nothing but sin unrepented of can hide his face from you. 2. Endeavour instantly to remove them. Methinks I see your impenitence like a dam, barring out from you those streams of mercy which would refresh and fertilize your souls. Oh, remove it without delay, but take care that your repentance is genuine and unreserved. External and temporary repentance will avail only for the removal of temporary judgments. That which is required in order to the final remission of your sins must be deep, spiritual, and abiding. It must show itself in the whole of your conduct and conversation. You will put away those pleasures, those vanities, those companions, that have been to you an occasion of falling, and you will walk mournfully before the Lord of hosts to the latest hour of your lives. You will loathe yourselves for all iniquities and abominations, as well after that God is pacified towards you as before. Let this, then, be begun immediately, even as the Israelites put off their ornaments on the very mount of Horeb. Let there be no delays, no waiting for a more convenient season, and let not the loss of heaven be the only object of your fear. Fear also the loss of the divine presence. This, as you have seen, was peculiarly dreaded by the Israelites. Let it also be peculiarly dreaded by you, and never cease to humble yourselves before God, till you have attained a sweet assurance of his guidance through this wilderness, and of his blessing in Canaan at the termination of your way. End of Sermon 46
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Past mercies pleaded before God, Exodus 33, verses 12 and 13. Thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight. Nothing is more profitable than to be brought, as it were, into the secret chamber of the saint, and to be a witness of his intercourse with God. His humble confidence, his holy boldness, his fervent supplications, his almost irresistible pleadings, give us a juster view of man's present salvation than any declarations, however strong, could convey. The blessedness of true religion is there embodied, and is therefore seen in all its fair proportions and magnificent dimensions. The prayer which we have just heard was uttered on occasion of the transgression of Israel in the matter of the golden calf. God had threatened to destroy the whole nation, but at the intercession of Moses, he so forgave them as to suspend his judgments, and to promise that, though he would conduct them no longer by his immediate presence, he would send an angel with them, who should lead them to the promised land. This, however, Moses could not endure. If God should not go with them, he judged it undesirable to be guided thither at all, and therefore he renewed his pleadings with God in their behalf, hoping to prevail to the full extent of his wishes. God had offered to destroy that whole nation, and to raise up another from the loins of Moses, and this token of God's good will towards him he laid hold of as a ground of hope, and urged it as a plea with God to grant him his full desire. Thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight. Let us notice here, first, the fact pleaded. God had given him the assurances here spoken of. We are not told exactly either when or how God had declared to him these glad tidings. It is probable, however, that it was by an audible voice during their late extraordinary intercourse, wherein, we are told, the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. The import of the declaration, however, is clear. It could not mean that God merely knew the name of Moses, for he knew the name of every human being as well as his. It means that from all eternity he had ordained Moses to his high station, and had appointed him to be a vessel of honour, in whom he would be glorified. I say not, but that the conduct of Moses, as contrasted with that of Aaron and the people of Israel, might bring down upon him more special tokens of God's favour, for I can have no doubt but that God, who rewardeth every man according to his works, did confer upon him many blessings as the reward of his piety, according to that established rule of his, them that honour me I will honour. But the primary source of all his blessedness was God's electing love and sovereign grace, though the manifestations of that love by an immediate assurance from heaven might be given him as a recompense for his fidelity. And are not similar assurances vouchsafed to God's faithful people at this day? If we examine the Holy Scriptures, we shall find that neither electing love nor the manifestation of it to the soul are confined to Moses. To Jeremiah this declaration was vouchsafed, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nation. Here the very same expression, I knew thee, is explained as equivalent to a foreordination of him to the prophetic office and the same sovereign grace is exercised towards men in reference also to their everlasting concerns. As it is said, whom God did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Nor must we understand this foreknowledge as forming the ground of God's future mercies to the persons foreknown, but rather as constituting the source from whence those blessings flow. As the Apostle says, God has chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy, not because he foresaw that we should be holy, but in order that we might be holy, and without blame before him in love. And it is on this electing love of his, and not on any merits or strength of ours, that our security in reality depends. For it is said, The foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. But does God manifest this his electing love to any now as he did to Moses? Yes, not indeed by an audible voice, but by other means sufficiently intelligible, both to themselves and others. What else is meant by the witness of the Spirit? For now, as well as in former days, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Nor is it in that way only that he makes known our relation to him, but by a work of grace upon our souls. For it was from the work of faith and labour of love and patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, which Paul saw in his Thessalonian converts, that he knew their election of God. 
The fact, then, which Moses pleaded with God is no other than what all his saints are at liberty to plead, for, as it is true that he knows them by name and that they have found grace in his sight, so is it true also that he has, more or less evidently, declared it to them all, not indeed to any by an audible voice, but to some by the secret influences of his spirit, and to all by the visible operations of his grace. The next point for our consideration is second, the petition urged. It is thought by many that an assurance of our acceptance with God would render us careless and supine, but the very reverse was its effect on Moses. The mercies vouchsafed to him only stimulated him to a more earnest desire after further blessings. He does not say, If I have found grace in thy sight, I am content, but if I have found grace in thy sight, show me thy way, that I may know thee, and that I may find further grace in thy sight. And such will be its effect on all God's chosen people. Blessings will be regarded by them not as gifts wherein to rest, but as pledges and earnests of future blessings. It was a wise and truly spiritual argument which was offered by Manoah's wife for the pacifying of her husband's mind. If the Lord were pleased to kill us, he would not have received a burnt offering or a meat offering at our hands, neither would he have showed us all these things, nor would, as at this time, have told us such things as these. Past mercies are rather urged by them in prayer as pleas for further blessings. It was thus that David regarded them, Thou hast delivered my soul from death. Wilt not thou deliver my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? And in this way will God's special favour operate on every ingenuous mind. Instead of being satisfied with a taste of his love, we shall hunger and thirst after the full banquet, and never cease from aspiring after a further growth in grace, till we have attained the full measure of the stature of Christ, and our graces are perfected in glory. Nor shall we be anxious about our own advancement only. We shall feel for God's honour also, and for the welfare of those around us. This appears in a striking point of view in the conduct of Moses on this occasion, for not content with finding grace himself, he adds, and consider that this nation is thy people, in which words he combines a tender regard for God's honour with an anxiety for his people's welfare. His further pleading also deserves attention. Wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? Now this shows us the true effect which a sense of God's love will produce. It will make us not only anxious to obtain richer communications of grace and peace to our own souls, but more earnest also to promote to the utmost of our power the good of all around us. The answer given to this petition leads us to notice, third, the plea admitted. God, in his mercy, vouchsafed to Moses an answer of peace. The plea peculiarly honoured God, in that, whilst it acknowledged his sovereign grace in the blessings already bestowed, it regarded him as a God of unbounded goodness, able and willing to fulfil all his petitions. And God's answer to it showed how greatly it was approved by him, the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Here I say, God not only grants the petition, but specifically founds the grant upon the very plea that had been urged. And when did he ever refuse to hear a petition so enforced? God loves to be addressed with confidence, provided the confidence be grounded on his power and grace. He bids us to come to him with a full assurance of faith, to ask what we will, and he gives us reason to hope that, if we come in faith, he will do for us not only what we ask, but exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. It might be feared that the importunity of Moses would offend him, but it did not, nor was he angry with Jacob, who wrestled with him in prayer all night, and boldly said, I will not let thee go until thou bless me. On the contrary, he commands us to wait on him with unwearied importunity, and to continue instant in prayer, till he bestow upon us all that our hearts can wish. The wider we open our mouths in prayer, the more he will fill them. To improve this subject, I would say, one, bear in mind the tokens of God's love. Look at what he has said to you in his word. Take his exceeding great and precious promises, and tell me whether you can ever want a plea to urge at the throne of grace. You admire his condescension and grace to Moses, but it is no other than what he will manifest to you if, like Moses, you consecrate yourselves to his service. You cannot indeed expect to converse with God face to face as a man converseth with his friend, but by faith you may approach him no less certainly and no less nearly, and may be sure of obtaining from him an answer of peace. Only take with you his words of promise, and spread them before you, and every jot and tittle of them shall be fulfilled to your souls. 2. Let the effect of his distinguishing grace be to make you more earnest in your desires after him. 
When David said, O God, thou art my God, he added, Early will I seek thee. In truth, this is our great encouragement to seek him, for if he loved us with an everlasting love, what may we not expect his loving kindness to do for us? If once you could bring yourselves to say, I am one of God's elect, and therefore am at liberty to relax my efforts in his service, you would need no further evidence that you are yet in the gall of bitterness, and have no part or lot in his salvation. If you have a good hope that you are his children indeed, then will you walk worthy of your high calling, and purify yourselves even as he is pure. 3. Improve your interest in God for the good of others. In this, Moses greatly excelled. He was willing and desirous even to be blotted out of God's book himself, if that by means of it he might obtain mercy for his offending nation. See to it, brethren, that your religion operate thus on you. Behold the state of those around you, how many thousands there are dying in their sins, and will you not interest yourselves in their behalf and labor to obtain for them the mercy that has been vouchsafed to you? Will you suffer your very friends and relatives to perish without any serious effort in their behalf? Oh, pity them and pray for them, and give unto God no rest, till you have obtained some evidence that you have not labored altogether in vain. End of Sermon 47《Sermon 48 of Exodus from Hori Homiletiki by Charles Simeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. God's presence with his church, Exodus 33, verse 14. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. It is not in the power of words to express, or of any finite imagination to conceive, the extent and riches of divine grace. The instances in which it was manifested to the Israelites of old, inasmuch as they were obvious to the eye of sense, are more calculated to excite our admiration, but the church at this time, and every believer in it, experiences equal tokens of God's kindness, if we can but view them with the eye of faith. It was under circumstances wherein the Israelites had justly incurred God's heavy displeasure that the promise in the text was made to them, and to us, if we do but use the proper means of attaining an interest in it, is the same promise given notwithstanding our heinous backslidings and innumerable provocations. That we may be stirred up to improve it, we shall point out, first, the blessings here promised. Though the promise was given immediately to Moses, yet it was not literally fulfilled either to him or to the people of that generation, since both he and they died in the wilderness. This circumstance alone would lead us to look for some mystical accomplishment which it should receive, and while the scripture warrants, it will also fully satisfy our inquiries on this head. The promise has relation to us as well as to the Israelites, and teaches us to expect, one, God's presence in our way. God had refused to proceed any further with the Israelites on account of their worshipping the golden calf. In answer, however, to the supplications of Moses, he had condescended to say that he would send an angel in his stead. But when Moses would not be satisfied with that, and continued to plead for a complete restoration of his favour to Israel, God, overcome as it were, by his importunity, promised to go before them still in the pillar and the cloud. More than this they did not need, and less than this could never satisfy one who had ever experienced the divine guidance and protection. And has not our blessed Lord made the same promise to us? Has he not said, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world? Has not his prophet assigned this as a reason why we should dissipate our fears and look forward to the eternal world with confidence and joy? On this promise, then, let us rely, and let us know that if we have God for our guide, our protector and provider, we have all that can be necessary for us in this dreary wilderness. 2. His glory as our end. Canaan was a place of rest to the Israelites after many difficulties that they sustained in their way to it, and heaven will be indeed a glorious rest to us after our weary pilgrimage in this world. Now, as the prospect of the land flowing with milk and honey sweetened all the fatigues and dangers of their journey in the wilderness, so the hope of that rest which remaineth for God's children encourages us to persevere in our labours to attain it, and this rest is promised us in spite of all the exertions of men or devils to deprive us of it. Our conflicts may be many and our trials great, but our rest is sure, for God hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. These blessings being so necessary, we should anxiously inquire into, second, the means of attaining them. Moses is here to be considered in a double view, as a type of Christ and as an example to us, and in these two capacities he teaches us to look for these blessings, one through the intercession of Christ. 
Christ, like Moses, has immediate access to the divine being who is wholly inaccessible to us, and it is owing to his entrance within the tabernacle to appear in the presence of God for us that the wrath of the Almighty has not burst forth upon us on numberless occasions and consumed us utterly. It is not only at our first return to God that we must seek the mediation of Jesus Christ, we must apply to him continually as our advocate with the Father, expecting nothing but through his prevailing intercession. This is the way pointed out for us by the beloved disciple, especially in seasons when fresh contracted guilt has excited just apprehensions of the divine displeasure. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Whether, therefore, we desire grace or glory, let us seek it through Christ, as the purchase of his blood and the consequence of his intercession. 2. Through our own importunate supplications. While the Israelites put off their ornaments in token of their unfeigned humiliation, Moses, as their representative, importuned God for mercy and urged his requests with the most forcible and appropriate pleas. In this manner should we also cry unto our God for pardon and acceptance, not enduring the thought of being left by him, lest we should come short of that rest to which he has undertaken to lead us. Nor should we cease to plead till we have an assured hope that he is reconciled towards us, and a renewed prospect of his continued presence with us to the end of life. It is in this way that his people have prevailed with him in every age, and he has pledged himself to us that, when our uncircumcised hearts are humbled, he will remember his holy covenant and return in mercy to us. Infer, one, how greatly are we indebted to Jesus Christ. Where shall we find one who has not made to himself some idol and provoked the Lord to jealousy? And how justly might God have sworn in his wrath that we should not enter into his rest? But our adorable Saviour has sprinkled the mercy seat with his precious blood, and offered up the incense of his own prevailing intercession on our behalf. Surely he is well called our peace, since he alone procures it, maintains it, perfects it. Let us bear in mind, then, our obligations to him, and ascribe to him the glory due unto his name. 2. How earnest ought we to be in intercession for each other? In the history before us we behold one man interceding for a whole nation, and that, too, under circumstances where there could be scarcely any hope to prevail. Yet he not only obtains a revocation of the sentence which God had passed, but a renewal and continuance of his wanted favours towards them. Shall we then neglect the duty of intercession, or intercede for each other merely in a formal way, as though we expected no answer to our petitions? Let us not so greatly dishonour God, and so wickedly slight our own privileges. We are expressly commanded to pray for one another, yea, and to make intercessions for all men, let us not doubt, therefore, but that by pleading earnestly with God we may obtain blessings for our friends, for our country, and for all whose cause we plead. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. 3. How happy are they who are enabled to live upon the promises! Were we to consider the length and difficulty of our way, the enemies we have to encounter, and our utter insufficiency for anything that is good, we should utterly despair of ever reaching the heavenly Canaan, but God promises to us his presence in the way and his rest at the end of our journey, and he who has promised is able also to perform. Let our trust then be in him, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Let us cast our cares on him who careth for us. Let our discouragements, yea, our very iniquities, bring us nearer to him and cause us to rely more simply on his word. Thus shall we experience his faithfulness and truth and be monuments of his unbounded mercy to all eternity. End of Sermon 48Sermon 49 of Exodus from Hori Homiletici by Charles Simeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. God's goodness, his glory. Exodus 33, verses 18 and 19. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. No man can have ever contemplated the intercession of Abraham in behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah without being astonished at the condescension of God, who would permit a worm of the earth so to encroach upon his goodness, and so to make every fresh concession a foundation for yet further petitions. Somewhat of the same kind we behold in Moses, when interceding for Israel, when God had threatened to destroy them for worshipping the golden calf. He had, by his importunity, prevailed on God to promise that he would suspend the execution of his judgments on them, and that, though he could no longer vouchsafe to conduct them himself, he would send an angel who should lead them in safety to the promised land. Having succeeded so far, he prosecuted his work of intercession, till he had prevailed on God yet further to bear with them, and to continue to them his presence and guidance as he had hitherto done. 
And now, having found Jehovah so infinitely condescending to him when importune for others, he determined to urge a petition for himself, a petition which under all other circumstances he could never have dared to ask. It was no less than this, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. His success in this petition will form the first part of our present subject, and some reflections arising out of that success will close it. Let us notice first his success in this petition. The petition itself must be first explained. Respecting its import, commentators have differed. Some have imagined that it proceeded from weakness and infirmity, as if he had needed further evidence of God's presence and favor. But a due attention to God's reply will remove all doubts respecting the precise meaning of his servant's request. Moses had enjoyed many visible tokens of God's presence in the burning bush, in the bright cloud which conducted Israel out of Egypt, on the burning mount, where he had been admitted into the immediate presence of the deity, and at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, whither God had descended on purpose to honor him in the sight of all Israel, and spoken with him face to face, as a man speaketh to his friend. Jehovah had appeared to him. How then, after so many manifestations of the divine presence, could he say, Show me thy glory? I answer, in all those manifestations he had seen only a symbol of the deity. Now, therefore, he desired a sight of the deity himself. He knew that the deity was visibly seen in heaven, and he did not know, but that he might also be seen on earth, and therefore he made this the subject of his request. God's gracious reply to him shows clearly that this was the thing desired, for he said to Moses, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Human nature in its present shape is incapable of sustaining so bright a vision as the unprotected eye is of gazing upon the meridian sun, and therefore whilst God approved of the petition as proceeding from an ardent desire after a more perfect knowledge of him, he told him that in its full extent it could not be granted, not because of any want of condescension in the deity to grant it, but for want of a capacity in Moses himself to sustain it. The answer of God to it will be now clear. I will make all my goodness pass before thee, so that, though the full effulgence of my glory will be veiled, all that can be endured by thee, and that will profitably correspond with thy petition, shall be granted. In respect of the effulgence of my glory, I will favor thee with such a view of my back parts, for my face thou canst not see, as shall give thee as full a conception of my glory as thou art capable of in thy present state, and by an audible voice will make known to thee my perfections, which thou art more concerned to know, and by an acquaintance with which thy soul will be far more enriched than it could be by any manifestation of my Godhead, however clear or bright. Accordingly, God put him into a cleft of a rock, and covered him there with his hand whilst he was passing by, and then withdrew his hand, that he might have such a distant and mitigated view of his back parts as might be seen without the utter destruction of the beholder. This vision God accompanied with a distinct and audible enunciation of his own attributes, as a God of infinite majesty, of almighty power, of unbounded mercy, and of immaculate and inexorable justice, all of which perfections were illustrative of his goodness. Here it is of importance to observe that God's justice no less than his mercy is an essential part of his goodness. As in human governments the exercise of justice, however painful to those who by their violations of the law have incurred a sentence of condemnation, is beneficial to the whole community, so it is in the divine government which, if it is allowed impunity to transgressors, would be disparaged and dishonored. The particular perfection of sovereignty is supposed by many to be in direct opposition to the attribute of goodness, and is therefore denied by them as having any existence, or at least any exercise in the divine government. But the very moment that God says to Moses, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, he adds, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. This perfection, therefore, in conjunction with all the rest, must be considered as constituting an essential part of the divine character, and as properly illustrating his goodness. And here let me remark that it is not in any single perfection that God's glory consists, but in the united and harmonious exercise of all. God is light, we are told. Now light consists in many different rays, some of a more brilliant and others of a more sombre aspect, and we can no more detach from it those which are of a darker hue than those which are more bright and vivid. It is in the union and adjusted mixture of all that light consists, and so it is with respect to the divine glory, to which all God's perfections, the more forbidding or terrific attributes of sovereignty and justice, no less than the more endearing perfections of love and mercy are necessary. And this view of the divine glory fully answered the wishes of Moses, which a more literal compliance with his petition, even if it could have been endured, would not so well have satisfied. 
A more distinct explanation of the particulars contained in this answer to Moses will more properly arise whilst we make, second, some reflections arising out of his success. Behold here, one, the excellence of the gospel. In the gospel, all that was vouchsafed to Moses is imparted to us with tenfold advantage, because, whilst a fuller insight into the revelation itself is granted to us than was ever vouchsafed to him, we can contemplate it at our leisure and without any such emotions as would tend to embarrass our minds. Behold then, I say, that Almighty God, who dwelleth in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen or can see, is become visible to us in the person of his Son, as it is said, No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. The Lord Jesus Christ, having in himself all the fullness of the Godhead, is on this very account called the image of the invisible God, because Jehovah, who in his own essence is invisible to mortal eyes, is become visible to us in the person of his Son, who is the brightness of his Father's glory and the express image of his person, insomuch that whoso hath seen him hath seen the Father. In truth, this was the mystery which Moses probably did not understand at the time, the mystery, I mean, of his being put into the cleft of the rock. For that rock was Christ, and it is in Christ only that God's perfections can find scope for exercise towards sinful man, and be all displayed in united splendor. But in Christ, mercy and truth meet together, and righteousness and peace kiss each other. Come then, beloved, come to the gospel, even to the glorious gospel of the blessed God. Come there, and behold in it, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, that you may be changed by it, even as Moses was, into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You are privileged beyond all the prophets, not excepting even the Baptist himself, for St. Paul says that what no eye had seen nor ear heard, neither had it entered into the heart of man to conceive, no, not even the eye or ear or heart of Moses himself, God had revealed unto the Christian church by his Spirit. And by that same Spirit working in and by the Word, God will reveal it unto you also, even all the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 2. The Power of Faith Faith is justly called the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. It penetrates into the highest heavens and beholds him that is invisible. It sees God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God, able to succor and ready to reward his faithful people. Yes, though now we see not our adorable Saviour with our bodily eyes, yet believing in him we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. We need not envy Moses, for great as his privilege was, it was not to be compared with ours. His eyes were gratified with a glorious sight, no doubt, and his mind was instructed with audible sounds, but he saw not the truths realized, nor did he fully comprehend the things revealed to him. But we have seen our God incarnate, and have beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. We have seen in his atonement all the perfections of God, harmonizing and glorified, and we understand clearly how God can be just and yet the justifier of sinful men. We know him to be a just God and yet a saviour, and live in the sweet assurance that he is not only merciful, but faithful also and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The world at large indeed and multitudes even of the Christian world have no experimental sense of these things, and the reason of their blindness is they have not faith, for all men have not faith, but to believers Christ manifests himself as he does not unto the world, and so enables them to behold his glory, that they are changed by it into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Blush then, ye who see in Christ no beauty nor comeliness for which he is to be desired. Know that it is the result of unbelief by which the devil has blinded you, and that if ye will believe, ye shall see the glory of God, ye shall see it not only in the exercise of his power, but also in the display of all his goodness. 3. The efficacy of prayer. Wonderfully is this illustrated in the passage before us. But shall we suppose that God is less condescending now than in the days of Moses, or that he will not answer prayer at this time as well as then? Know ye that God is the same gracious God as ever, with him is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. The prayer of the upright is still his delight, as much as at any period of the world, and that those who come to him in his Son's name he will in no wise cast out. On the contrary, he tells us that we may ask what we will, and it shall be done unto us. There is no limit to his answers to believing prayer, except such as his own glory or our capacity have imposed. It is not in him that we are straitened, but in our own bowels. How then should we urge the petition of Moses, and say, O Lord, I beseech thee, show me thy glory? 
Let us have but one thing to desire of the Lord, and let that be that we may behold his glory. Let us go into his presence and say with David, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee, my soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is, to see thy power and thy glory, and God will draw aside the veil that intercepts our views of him, yea, he will come down from the habitation of his holiness and his glory, and present himself before us, saying, Here I am. He would even fulfil to us his promise, hearing us before we ask, and answering whilst we yet are speaking to him. Oh, that we would plead with him, as he has commanded us to do, and give him no rest, till he answers us in the desire of our hearts, and let us not imagine that he will be offended at the largeness of our petitions, for he is as willing as he is able to do exceeding abundantly for us above all that we can ask or think. Let us open our mouths ever so wide, he will most surely fill them. 4. The Blessedness of Heaven When Peter beheld his Lord transfigured upon Mount Tabor, he said, It is good to be here. And if such a view of Christ's glory with his bodily eyes was so delightful, what must it be for our disembodied spirits to be introduced into his immediate presence and to see him as he is? What views shall we then have of the perfections of the Godhead all uniting and glorified in the work which he accomplished on the cross? Truly that heavenly city where he abides has no need of the sun or moon to lighten it, for he will be the light thereof, and with his glory shall every soul be filled. If we account Moses happy when favoured with his transient visions of God, what shall we be when around his throne we behold him in all his glory and look forward to a never-ending duration of our bliss? Oh, that we could contemplate more the blessedness of that state and live more in an habitual preparation for it. Lift up your hearts, brethren, for the blessed period is nigh at hand. Be looking for it and hasting to it, and let nothing short of that have any glory in your eyes by reason of the glory that excelleth. Take now already the golden harps into your hands and begin the blissful song. Emulate to the utmost of your power those who are gone before you, and soon you shall join the countless choir in singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. End of Sermon 49《Sermon 50 of Exodus from Hori Homiletiki by Charles Simeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Perfections of God. Exodus 34, verses 5 to 7. And the Lord descended in the cloud, and stood with him there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. The voice of inspiration says to every one of us, Acquaint thyself with God and be at peace. An acquaintance with ourselves, which indeed is equally necessary to our salvation, will only lead us to despair, unless its effects be counteracted with a proportionable knowledge of our God. The more we discern of our own depravity, the more must we see of our guilt, our danger, and our helplessness, nor can anything pacify our consciences and allay our fears, but a view of the divine perfections, as united and harmonizing in the work of redemption. But that once obtained, our minds will be serene and happy, and the more complete our view of God is, the more firm will be our confidence in Him, and the more sublime our joy. Moses, well aware of this, prayed to God to show Him His glory. To this request God graciously condescended and appointed Him a place where He would meet Him and make this discovery unto Him. In discoursing upon this marvellous event, we shall notice, first, the situation in which Moses was placed. We are told that God stood with him there, but this not being a prominent feature in the text, we shall premise some observations as introductory to our remarks upon it. In the first place, we would observe that, in interpreting the Holy Scriptures, we are not at liberty to indulge our own fancy. We must approach them with sacred awe and reverence, and give such explanations of them only as we verily believe to be agreeable to the mind of that blessed spirit through whose inspiration they were written. Next, we observe that the whole of the Mosaic economy was of a typical and mysterious nature, and that, though it is sometimes difficult to ascertain the precise import of some events, yet the meaning of those which are more striking is clear and obvious, and may be stated without any fear of deviating from the truth. Further, there are many events of which we should have made only a general improvement, which God himself has marked as conveying very minute and particular instruction, for instance, the miracle wrought by Moses when he struck the rock, and thereby gave the whole nation a supply of water, 
which followed them all through the wilderness, might be supposed to teach us only that God will supply the wants of his people who put themselves under his guidance. But St. Paul teaches us to look deeper into that miracle and to find in it the great mysteries of redemption. He tells us that that rock was Christ, and that the water which they drank of was spiritual drink, or, in other words, that the miracle denoted that Christ, being struck with the rod of the law, becomes unto us a never-failing source of all spiritual blessings. We only observe further that there was no occasion whatever in which we might more certainly expect to find something typical and mysterious than in that before us. God was about to reveal himself to Moses in a manner that he never did, either before or since, to any mortal man, and the directions which he gave, previous to this discovery of himself, and which were necessary for the safety of his favoured servant, were so minute and significant, that we cannot doubt but that the whole transaction was replete with mysterious import and most valuable information. We come now to notice the situation in which Moses was placed. God commanded Moses to go up to Mount Sinai and stand upon a rock, and promised that he would there pass by him in a visible manner, but because it was not possible for him to behold the splendour of the divine glory, God told him that he would put him into a cleft of the rock, and discover to him such a view of his glory as his frail nature could sustain. Accordingly, having put him into the cleft of the rock, and covered him with his hand, to prevent him from getting any sight of his face, which he could not have seen consistently with the preservation of his life, he passed by, and then, withdrawing his hand, he permitted him to see his back parts, that is, to have such an indistinct view of him as we have of a person who has passed by us. Now Sinai and Horeb, it appears, were two tops of the same mountain. We are told in the context that God called Moses to come up unto Mount Sinai, yet the preceding chapter informs us that the Israelites were at that time encamped by the Mount of Horeb. The whole nineteenth chapter of Exodus informs us that the intercourse which Moses had with God at the time of the giving of the law was on Mount Sinai, whereas Moses elsewhere informs us that he stood before the Lord in Horeb, and that the Lord made a covenant with them in Horeb, and that the people provoked the Lord to wrath in Horeb. Hence it is manifest that the terms Horeb and Sinai are used as nearly or altogether synonymous, because the same transactions are represented indifferently as having taken place on the one or on the other. Now it has already appeared that the rock in Horeb is declared by God himself to have been a lively representation of Christ, and therefore we may well suppose that this rock, which was certainly in the same mountain, if not the very identical rock, was intended also to prefigure him, more especially as the putting of Moses into the cleft of it exactly represents the benefits we receive by virtue of an interest in Christ. To those who are not in Christ, God is a consuming fire, and if he were to pass by any persons who have not fled to Christ for refuge, he would instantly burn them up as thorns and consume them with the brightness of his coming. Besides, it is in Christ only that we have even the faintest view of God, because it is in Christ only that his perfections are displayed to man, and it is only when we are in Christ that we have any eyes to behold them. Here then we see not only that there is something mysterious in the situation of Moses, but that a due consideration of it is necessary to a full understanding of the passage before us. In considering this singular favour conferred on Moses, we proceed to notice, second, the revelation which God gave of himself to him. Though the terms in which God described his perfections are many, yet they may be reduced to three heads— 1. His majesty. God, in calling himself the Lord, the Lord God, intimated that he was that eternal, self-existent being who gave existence to every other being and exercised unlimited authority over the works of his hands. His dominion is universal, his power irresistible, his sovereignty uncontrolled. He doth according to his will in the armies of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, nor can any stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Such a manifestation of his majesty was peculiarly necessary in order that our obligations to him might appear in their proper light, for never, till we have learned to acknowledge and adore his sovereignty, shall we be able rightly to appreciate his love and mercy. 2. His mercy. Many expressions are heaped together upon this subject because mercy is the attribute in which God peculiarly delights, and because he desires to impress our minds with right apprehensions of it. God first, in general terms, declares himself to be merciful and gracious, by which we are to understand that he is ever ready to pity the miserable and relieve the needy. He is in his own nature propensed to love and kindness, and forward to exercise his benevolence, whenever he can do it in consistency with his other perfections. The first fruit of his mercy is long-suffering. And how long did he bear with the antediluvian world? 
for the space of one hundred and twenty years did he wait to see if by the ministry of Noah he could turn them from their evil ways. What can we conceive more insufferable than the conduct of the Israelites in the wilderness? They were always murmuring and rebelling against God, who had done such great things for them, yet he did bear with them forty years. But we need not look back to the antediluvians or the Jews. What monuments have we ourselves been of his patience and long-suffering? How have we provoked him to anger every day of our lives? Yet we are here at this moment on praying ground instead of being where we most richly deserve to be, in the very depths of hell. Nor has he merely borne with us, he has shown himself also abundant in goodness and truth. He has been doing us good from the first moment of our existence to this present hour. He has made his sun to shine and the rain to descend upon us, and given us fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. But he has done infinitely more for us than this, for he has given his only dear son to die for us, and his good spirit to instruct us, and has been calling us by the ministrations of his servants to receive all the blessings, both of grace and glory. Many great and precious promises also has he given us, not one of which has he ever falsified, or shown the least reluctance to fulfil. Moreover, this kindness of his extends to the latest generations, for he is keeping mercy for thousands that are yet unborn. One reason why he bears with so many proud rebels is that he has mercy in reserve for many who are to proceed from their loins, who would never be brought into existence if he were to execute on their offending parents the judgments they deserved. Who can tell he may have kept mercy for some of us to this present hour, and the time may now be come wherein he shall make us willing to accept it? Would to God it might be so. But the completion of his mercy is seen in his forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Search the sacred records and see what sins he has forgiven, what sins before conversion, what sins after conversion and you will find that there is no species or degree of sin which he has not pardoned, even though it have been often repeated and long continued in. Let any one attempt to enumerate his own transgressions, and he will find them more in number than the sands upon the seashore, and sufficient, if visited according to their desert, to sink the whole world into perdition. Yet if he be a believer in Christ, they are all forgiven. How many iniquities, then, is God continually pardoning in every quarter of the globe? but this is the habit which most characterizes his nature and perfections. Though he cannot look upon iniquity without the utmost abhorrence of it, yet his judgment, his strange work, and mercy is his delight. 3. His justice. The concluding sentence of our text is understood by some to mean that when he begins to punish he will not make a full end, but in judgment will remember mercy, and it is certain that it will bear this sense because literally translated it stands thus, clearing he will not clear. But then... In this description of his attributes God would wholly omit his justice, which we cannot suppose he would, nor would the words in this sense at all agree with the words that follow them. We take them, therefore, as they are in our translation, and according to their obvious meaning, they convey to us a most important truth. God does indeed take pleasure in the exercise of mercy, but still he will never violate the rights of justice. He will pardon, but not the impenitent or unbelieving. It is to those only who repent and believe the gospel that he will finally approve himself a reconciled God. Nothing shall ever prevail upon him to clear one guilty person who holds fast his iniquities or will not wash them away in the Redeemer's blood. It may be asked, will he not have respect to the multitude of those who are in that predicament, or will he not be softened when he shall see them weeping and wailing and gnashing their teeth in hell? We answer, no, he will by no means clear the guilty, if they will live and die in sin, they must eat the fruit of their own doings. It is worthy of particular notice in this place that Moses designed to see God's glory, and that God said he would make all his goodness pass before him, from whence we are assured that God's goodness and his glory are as much seen in his justice as in any other attribute whatever. Indeed, if God were destitute of this perfection, he would cease to be either glorious or good. He could not be glorious because not perfect, nor could he be good because he would give license to his creatures to violate his law, and to throw his whole government into confusion, and to render themselves miserable, for not God himself could make them happy while sin lived and reigned in their hearts. It is by his justice that he deters men from sin, and teaches them to flee from that which would embitter even paradise itself, and therefore justice, however severe may be its aspect upon sin and sinners, is indeed a part of the divine goodness and a ray of the divine glory. In for one, how wonderful is the efficacy of prayer. Moses, notwithstanding an apparent prohibition, had interceded with God on behalf of the idolatrous Israelites, and had prevailed. 
Still, however, God, to mark his displeasure, refused to go with the people any more, and said he would commit the guidance of them to an angel. But Moses, having thus far obtained a favorable audience, requested and urged that God himself should still go with them, as he had hitherto done. Nothing would satisfy him but this. When he had succeeded in this, he grew bolder still, and asked, what no living creature had ever dared to ask, O God, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. God approved of his boldness, and granted him this also. Oh, what would he not grant to us, if we would ask in humility and faith? He says himself, Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. O brethren, see in this instance the efficacy of prayer, and know that if you asked forgiveness for the vilest of all sins, and prayed to have the presence of God with you all through this wilderness, and even begged to have the glory of God himself pass before your eyes, it should be given you. Your iniquities should be forgiven, you should have God for your constant protector and guide, and he would shine into your hearts to give you the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. O oh, pray without ceasing and without doubting. 2. Of what importance is it to obtain an interest in Christ? All, except the true Christian, have erroneous views of God. Some are led by his majesty or justice to give way to desponding fears. Others, from a sight of his grace and mercy, are induced to cherish presumptuous hopes. It is the Christian alone who sees his majesty tempered with mercy, and his mercy harmonizing with the demands of justice. No man can have the sight of God till he be put into the cleft of the rock. What we said at the beginning we now repeat, that to all who are not in Christ God will be a consuming fire. Seek then, my brethren, to be found in Christ. Then shall you see the King in his beauty, then shall you behold him transfigured as it were before your eyes, and have a foretaste of that blessedness which you shall enjoy, when you shall see him as you are seen, and know him even as you are known. End of Sermon 50《Sermon 51 of Exodus from Hori Homiletiki by Charles Simeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Jehovah, a jealous God. Exodus 34, verse 14. The Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Practical religion is altogether founded on the character of God. If he were, as many foolishly imagine him to be, a being like unto ourselves, a very small measure of duty and service would be all that he could reasonably require. But being a God of infinite majesty and unbounded mercy, it is not possible to exercise towards him too great a measure of fear and love, nor can he be too strict in exacting at our hands the utmost that we are able to pay. In this view, the feeling of jealousy, which seems at first sight not to comport well with our notions of the Supreme Being, may very well be ascribed to him, and we may justly say, as in our text, the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Let us contemplate, first, the character of God as here described. Jealousy does exist in the bosom of Jehovah. Jealousy in man is a painful feeling arising from a suspicion that a measure of the regard due to us is transferred to another who is in no respect entitled to it, and so deep is the wound which it inflicts, especially on a husband who conceives himself to have been dishonored by his wife, that nothing can ever heal it. Jealousy, says Solomon, is the rage of a man, therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance, he will not regard any ransom, neither will he rest content, though thou givest many gifts. In God also does it burn with a most vehement flame. They have moved me to jealousy, says God, and a fire is kindled in mine anger, and it shall burn unto the lowest hill, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. I will heap mischiefs upon them, and will spend mine arrows upon them. To the same effect, the prophet Nahum also speaks, God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth, and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. Nor is this unworthy of his character. On account of his own inconceivable excellency, he deserves to stand without a rival in our affections. On account of what he has also done for us in creation, in providence, and in grace, especially in the gift of his only dear Son to die for us, and, I may add, on account of the relation in which he stands as the husband of his church, he has additional claims to our supreme regard, and if he see that we are in any respect suffering anything to stand in competition with him, he may well be jealous. In truth he could not, consistently with his own perfections, dispense with these obligations even for a moment. He cannot give his glory to another. He would cease to be God, if he could suffer his own inalienable rights to be withheld from him, and not express his indignation against the idolatrous offender. It is his very name and nature to be jealous. As to those who love him, he is a God of love and mercy, 
So is he, of necessity, to those who alienate their affections from him, a jealous god and a consuming fire. From this view of his character, let us proceed to notice, second, our duty as arising from it. We must not act in any way inconsistent with the relation which we bear to him. We must not suffer, one, any alienation of our affections from him. We are bound to love him with all our heart and all our mind and all our strength and all our soul and all our strength. Nothing is to be loved by us but in subordination to him and for his sake. If anything under heaven be permitted to share our regards with him, we are guilty of idolatry. Nothing is accepted when the apostle says, Set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. We must take care, therefore, not only not to love anything above him, but to hate even father and mother, and our own lives also in comparison of him. 2. Any abatement in our attentions to him. God speaks of our espousals to him as a season of peculiar love, and at that season we are, for the most part, delighted with everything that may bring us into nearer communion with him and express the feelings of our heart towards him. Then the reading of his word and secret prayer and an attendance on the public ordinances of religion are to us sources of the sublimest joy. But if we are become cold in these respects, and the ardour of our love abate, can we suppose that he will be pleased with us? Will he not say to us as to the church at Ephesus, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love? Surely, if an earthly husband will not endure a declension in his wife's regards, much less will the God of heaven and earth endure a diminution of ours. 3. Any unnecessary intercourse with things which have a tendency to draw us from him. This is particularly marked in the preceding context. God requires his people not to form alliance with their heathen neighbors, nor to accept invitations to their idolatrous feasts. He commands them to destroy their altars and break down their images and cut down their groves, and to forbear even the mention of the gods whom they worshipped. He knew how soon evil communications would corrupt good manners, and therefore he forbade any unnecessary intercourse with the heathen. And... Has he not given a similar injunction to us also? Has he not declared that as soon as may light and darkness have communion with each other, or Christ with Belial as a believer with an unbeliever, and that therefore we must come out from an ungodly world and be separate, and not touch the unclean thing, if we would have him for a father unto us, and act as becomes his sons and daughters? This is a gracious and merciful warning similar to what an affectionate husband would give his wife in relation to the society of one who was seeking to seduce her, and we must carefully attend to it, and be no more of the world than Christ himself was of the world. We must endeavour to keep our garments clean amidst the pollutions that are around us, and hate even the garments spotted by the flesh. We must not be contented with avoiding evil, but must abstain even from the appearance of it. Address. 1. Those who think it an easy matter to serve God. Though a woman may without any great difficulty perform her duties to an affectionate husband, where the bias of her natural affections is on the side of duty. It is not so easy to execute all that our God requires, for there we stem the current of nature instead of being carried forward by it. Hence, when the whole people of Israel were so ready to bind themselves to serve their God, Joshua warned them that they could not do it without divine aid. So let me say to you that, if you will indeed give yourselves to the Lord and take Him as your portion, you must not engage in your own strength, but must look unto your God, who alone can work in you either to will or to do. 2. Those who are unconscious of having given occasion to God to be jealous of them. Look not merely at your acts, but at the dispositions of your mind, and then judge. He says, Give me thy heart. Now see whether your affections have not strayed, yea, whether you have not been like the wild ass in the wilderness, whom none can overtake or keep from her mate, till the time for parturition has nearly arrived. This is an humiliating but a just image of our conduct, and if we will not acknowledge it and humble ourselves under a sense of it, God will surely plead with us to our confusion. 3. Those who are ashamed of their past ways. Amongst men the unfaithfulness of a wife may have been such as to preclude a possibility of her restoration to the station she once held, but no departures, however grievous, shall prevent our restoration to the divine favour, if, with sincerity of heart, we humble ourselves before him, in the name of God himself I am commanded to proclaim this, and to invite the most abandoned of you all to return to him. Return then unto him, and so your iniquity shall not be your ruin. End of Sermon 51
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Three Yearly Feasts at Jerusalem Exodus 34, verses 23 and 24 Thrice in the year shall all your men-children appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel, for I will cast out the nations before thee, and enlarge thy borders. Neither shall any man desire thy land, when thou shalt go up to appear before the Lord thy God thrice in the year. Besides the weight of evidence arising from the accomplishment of prophecy and the working of miracles to prove the divine origin of the Mosaic dispensation, there is a great abundance of internal evidence in the dispensation itself that corroborates and confirms our conclusions respecting it. What impostor that ever lived would have been weak enough to put his religion to such a test as this, which we have now read? No one would have done it even for a few years, whilst he himself might be at hand to execute his own plans. Much less would any man transmit such an ordinance to posterity, when one single instance of failure would be sufficient to subvert his whole religion. But not to dwell on this, we will first draw your attention to the institution itself, it was that all the males should go up to Jerusalem thrice in a year from every quarter of the land to keep a feast there unto the Lord. Now consider, one, of what nature this appointment was. It was partly political and partly religious. As a political ordinance it was intended to cement the people together and to keep them united in love. Had they had no common centre of union, no appointed means of communion, the different tribes might in process of time have forgotten their relation to each other, and have sought their own separate interests, instead of acting in concert with each other for the good of the whole. But by this expedient, all who had the greatest influence among them were brought frequently into the closest fellowship with each other, and on their return to their respective homes, diffused the same brotherly affection through the land. As a religious ordinance, it was of singular importance not only for the preserving of the people from idolatry, to which they were always prone, but for the impressing of their minds with a love to vital godliness. The times appointed for their assembling at Jerusalem were at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, to commemorate their deliverance from Egypt and from the sword of the destroying angel, at the Feast of Pentecost, to commemorate no lesser mercy the giving of the law, and at the Feast of Tabernacles, or of ingathering as it was called, to commemorate their living in tents in the wilderness, and to render thanks for the fruits of the earth which they had gathered in. Thus at the returning seasons of spring, of summer, and of autumn, they were required to commemorate the mercies which had been vouchsafed to their nation, and with joy and gratitude to acknowledge their obligations to Jehovah. What a blessed tendency had such seasons to keep alive in their minds a sense of their high privileges, and to spread a savour of true religion through every family in the land. To what care God took to guard against the objections to which it was liable. It would of necessity occur to all that, by their observance of this ordinance, their land on every side would be exposed to the incursions of their enemies, who would not fail to take advantage of their absence, and to retaliate upon them the injuries they had sustained. In this view it should seem that they would be highly criminal in leaving the women, the children, the aged, and the sick in such a defenceless state, and that it would be more advisable to depute some from every quarter to represent the rest, but God would not be served by deputy, he commanded all to keep the feasts at the place prescribed, and to remove all apprehensions about their property or their families. He pledged himself to protect their frontier, and so to overrule the minds of their enemies, that they should not even desire to invade their land at any of those seasons. They had seen how able he was to turn the minds of their enemies in Egypt, who had just before sent, yea, even thrust them out of the land, laden with spoil, and he engaged that to the remotest period of their existence as a nation he would interpose for them with equal effect, if only they would trust their concerns to him and serve him in his appointed way. We indeed have nothing to do with the institution before us, nor do we much admire the formal custom, which seems to have arisen from it of attending at the Lord's Supper on the three great festivals of our church, while we live in the neglect of that ordinance all the year besides, Nevertheless, the institution is far from being uninteresting to us, as will be seen, while we second, suggest some observations founded upon it. Much might we speak respecting the providence of God, who so miraculously wrought upon the minds of their enemies, that no infidel could ever adduce one single instance wherein this promise failed. We might speak also respecting the happiness of true religion, and draw a parallel between the Jews assembling for their solemn feasts and Christians universally uniting in the same grateful acknowledgments and heavenly joys. 
but there are two observations to which, as arising clearly out of the subject, and as being of singular importance, we would limit your attention. One, the service of God is of paramount obligation. We have seen what strong objections might have been made to the ordinance before us, which yet was required punctually to be observed, and we know that carnal reason, as much to suggest in opposition to the commands of God, much that is founded in fact and in the experience of mankind. If I serve my God according to the requisitions of his word, I shall be forced to deny myself many things that are pleasing to flesh and blood. I shall also be singular, and shall expose myself to the derision and contempt of those who are hostile to true religion. My very friends may turn against me, and I may suffer materially in my temporal interests. All this, and more than this, is very true, but it affords no reason whatever for disobeying the commands of God. The Jews would doubtless on many occasions have preferred their domestic ease and comfort, or the occupations in which they were engaged, to the fatigue and trouble of a long, expensive journey. But the command was positive, and so is ours. It admits of no excuses. We are expressly required to deny ourselves, to take up our cross daily, and to follow Christ. And it is on these terms only that we can be his disciples. If called to forsake father and mother, and houses and lands, for the gospel's sake, we must forsake, yea, and hate them all, if they stand in competition with Christ, or would draw us from our allegiance to Him. We must not love even life itself in comparison of Him, but cheerfully sacrifice it at any time, and in any way that our fidelity to Him may require. It is not necessary that I should live, said a great general, but it is necessary that I should proceed. Thus must the Christian say, Tell me not of difficulties or dangers. It is not necessary that I should be rich or honoured, or even that I should live, but it is necessary that I should obey my God. A heated furnace or a den of lions is nothing to me. Duty is all. If I die for conscience' sake, I rejoice that I am counted worthy to suffer in so good a cause. This was the mind of Paul. None of these things move me, says he. Neither count I my life dear unto me. I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the Lord's sake. Oh, that we might be like him, men of piety, men of principle, men of firmness and decision. 2. They who serve the Lord shall be saved by him. The trust which the Jews at those stated seasons reposed in God were never disappointed, nor shall ours be, though all the hosts, both of men and devils, were confederate against us. The challenge is justly given us, who ever trusted in the Lord and was confounded. There is a great fault amongst religious people in relation to this. Many are distressing themselves with doubts and fears. Shall I persevere to the end? Shall I be saved at last? A holy caution is doubtless very becoming in every state, but not a slavish fear. Our concern should be to serve God. It is His concern, if I may so speak, to save us. Even from temporal trials He can and will protect us as far as is for our good. As for spiritual and eternal evils, he will assuredly protect us from them. Who is he that shall harm us, if we be followers of that which is good? Satan, it is true, will never for a moment relinquish his desire to assault us. That roaring lion will never intermit his wish to devour. But God will be as a wall of fire round about us, and his grace shall be at all times sufficient for us. Nor shall any temptation take us beyond what we are able to bear, or without a way to escape from it. Know ye then, brethren, in whom ye have believed, that he is able to keep that which you have committed to him. Know that, if only your eyes were opened, you might at this moment see horses of fire and chariots of fire all around you, and an host of angels encamped around you for your protection. Invade not any longer the province of your God. Leave to him the care of preserving you, and confine your solicitude to the serving and honouring of him. This is your duty, it is also your privilege. The direction of God himself is this. Commit your souls to him in well-doing as into the hands of a faithful creator. Be assured that he will not fail you, and that he who hath promised is able also to perform. End of Sermon 52Sermon 53 of Exodus from Hori Homiletiki by Charles Simeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Vale of Moses Exodus 34, verse 35, And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, and Moses put the veil upon his face again, until he went in to speak with him. It is an established and invariable truth that those who honour God shall surely be honoured by him. 
We have the clearest evidence of this, both in the antediluvian and patriarchal ages. Did Abel honor God by his offering, Enoch by his walk, and Noah by his faithful warning of an ungodly world? They also were blessed with signal manifestations of the divine favor. Did Abraham, Lot, or Job display singular piety? They were as singularly protected, delivered, and exalted by their God. The same we observe of Moses. He was faithful to his God when all Israel, not excepting Aaron himself, revolted from him, and to him did God vouchsafe so bright a glory that none of his countrymen were able to fix their eyes upon him, insomuch that he was constrained to put a veil upon his face in order to facilitate their access to him and restore his wanted opportunities of conversing with them. This veiling of his face is to be the subject of our present consideration, and we shall notice it in a twofold view. First, as a kind expedient, the face of Moses shone with a dazzling and overpowering splendor. He had for forty days and nights been communing with God upon Mount Sinai, and it pleased God for the confirmation and increase of his authority among the people to send him down to them with a luster upon his countenance that should at once convince them whose servant he was and whose authority he bare. At the first sight of him, both Aaron and all the people were affrighted. This was the natural effect of that guilt which they had so recently contracted. They feared that he was sent as an avenger to punish their iniquity. When they found that their organs of sight were too weak to behold the bright effulgence of his glory, they felt how unable they must be to withstand the terror of his arm. As the brightness of Moses's face was supernatural, so the effect of it on the people was peculiar to that occasion. But there is an awe inspired by the presence of every good man in proportion to the weight of his character and the eminence of his piety. Herod, though a king, feared John because he knew that he was a just and holy man, and Job tells us that at his presence the aged rose and the young men hid themselves. To facilitate their access to him he adopted the expedient mentioned in the text. He was not conscious of the splendor with which his countenance was irradiated till their inability to behold him convinced him of it. Nor is it ever found that those who bear much of the divine image are conscious of their own superiority. Their minds are fixed on their own defects rather than on their excellencies, and from their deep views of their remaining corruptions they are ready to count themselves less than the least of all saints. When he perceived the effect which the sight of him produced, instead of being elated with the honour conferred upon him, or desiring to employ it for the maintenance of his own authority, he put a veil upon his face to conceal its brightness, and called them to him that he might impart unto them the instructions he had received from God. As often as he returned to commune with his God, he took off the veil, as not either necessary or befitting in the divine presence, but in all his intercourse with the people he covered his face. On this point many useful thoughts occur, but we shall reserve them for the close of our subject, where they will be more advantageously suggested in a way of practical improvement. We pass on to notice this act of Moses, second, as an instructive emblem. Whether Moses himself understood the full signification of his own act, we cannot say. It is probable he did not, for certain it is that the prophets in many instances could not see the full scope of their own prophecies. But whether he understood it or not, we are assured on infallible authority that his covering his face with the veil was intended by God to represent, one, the darkness of that dispensation. The Mosaic dispensation was a shadow of good things to come, but what the substance was none could exactly ascertain. The very tables which at this time Moses had brought down from God contained a law, the nature, intent, or duration of which none of them could understand. They could not discern its spiritual import, but judged of it only by the letter. They thought it a covenant of life, whereas it was not at all designed to give life, but rather to be a ministration of condemnation and death. They supposed it was to continue to the end of time, when it was merely given for a season, till the things which it prefigured should be accomplished. Its splendor was veiled from their sight, as was the brightness of Moses's face, and St. Paul informs us that the expedient to which Moses resorted was intended to show that the law was in itself glorious, but that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of it. Two, the blindness of the human mind. There were in the Jews of those days, and there are at this hour a blindness of mind and an obduracy of heart which render them almost invincibly adverse to the truth of God. We see it and wonder at it in them, but are unconscious of it in ourselves and insensible of it as a matter of personal experience. Yet we are, in fact, greater monuments of obduracy than they, because there was a veil over their dispensation which is removed from ours. Did they continue stiff-necked and rebellious amidst all the mercies and judgments 
with which they were visited. So do we. The God of this world hath blinded us. Our understanding is darkened. We are alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in us, and because of the blindness of our hearts, we hate the light and will not come to it, lest our deeds should be reproved. Now this propensity in human nature to reject the truth and to account it foolishness was intended to be marked by this significant action of the Jewish lawgiver. St. Paul explains it in this very way. Their minds, says he, were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away, even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. 3. The benefit to be expected from their promised Messiah. The occasional removal of his veil, when he went into the presence of his God, showed that it was not always to continue on the dispensation, but that at a future period it should be removed, and the dispensation itself abolished. The Messiah, to whom they were constantly directed to look, as to that promised seed in whom all the nations of the earth should be blessed, was to take away both, the foregoing veils, the one by fulfilling the law in all its parts, and the other by communicating his Holy Spirit to all his followers. Then the true nature of that law would be fully understood, and Christ would be recognized as the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Then should the glory of that dispensation be clearly seen, and the incomparably brighter glory of the Christian dispensation be seen also. For this view of the subject we are also indebted to the Apostle Paul, who tells us that the gospel, as a ministration of the Spirit and of righteousness, was to succeed and to eclipse the law, and that when the Jews should turn to the Lord, the Messiah would take away the veil from their hearts and bring them into the light and liberty of the children of God. In the former part of our discourse we forbore to make several remarks which we reserved for this place, and which, while they elucidate the subject, will afford rich instruction. One, to ministers. We have seen what Moses did, and in some respects we should imitate him, but in others we should adopt a directly opposite conduct. It was truly amiable in him to condescend to the infirmities of the people and to veil his own glory for their good. Thus should every minister prefer the instruction of his people to the display of his own talents, or the aggrandizement of his own name. It is pitiful indeed to court applause for our learning when we should be converting souls to Christ. St. Paul, qualified as he was to astonish men with his parts and talents, would rather speak five words to the understandings of men than ten thousand words in an unknown tongue. Our blessed Lord spake as men were able to hear it, and reserved his fuller instructions till his hearers were better qualified to receive them. Paul also gave only milk to babes, whilst to those who were of full age he administered meat. Thus should we do, lest we blind or dazzle men by an unseasonable display even of truth itself. But are we like Moses to use concealment? No, the Apostle expressly guards us against imitating Moses in this particular. Not as Moses, says he, not as Moses, who put a veil over his face, but, on the contrary, we must use great plainness of speech. There is nothing in the Gospel that requires concealment, nor anything that admits of it. We must declare unto men the whole counsel of God. We must discriminate so far as to judge what will and what will not be profitable to men, but the truth we must declare without the smallest mixture or reserve, and by manifestation of the truth must commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. It must be our labour to rend away the veil from the hearts of our hearers, for if our gospel be veiled, it is veiled to them that are lost. The glory of God shines in the face of Jesus Christ, and to show them that glory in all its brightness is to be the one object of our labour, as it is the unwearied effort of the devil to conceal it from their view. 2. To hearers, you should be aware that there is a veil upon your hearts, else you will never pray unto the Lord to remove it. Even the Apostle Paul, learned as he was in all biblical knowledge, had, as it were, scales full from his eyes, when God was pleased to lead him to a clear view of his gospel. So must the eyes of your understanding also be enlightened, before you can discern aright the things of the Spirit, but though God has appointed ministers to instruct you, you are all at liberty, yea, you are required to go yourselves, like Moses, into the presence of your God. Do not, however, veil your faces before him, but go exactly as you are. Your fellow creatures could not endure to see all that is in your hearts, nor would it be of any use to reveal it to them, but to God all things are naked and open, and the more fully you unbosom yourself to him, the more will his blessing come upon you. It is by putting off the veil from your own hearts that you shall, with open, unveiled face, behold his glory, and by beholding it be changed into the same image from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. 
Truly, you shall, in a measure, experience the same benefit as Moses did. You shall be beautified with salvation. The beauty of the Lord your God shall be upon you. And all that behold you shall be constrained to acknowledge that God is with you of a truth. When this effect is produced, let your light shine before men. You are not called to veil it, but rather to display it, not indeed for your own honour, that were a base, unworthy motive, but for the honour of your God, that they who behold your good works may glorify your Father that is in heaven. End of Sermon 53 Sermon 54 of Exodus from Hori Homiletiki by Charles Simeon This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The offerings for the tabernacle, Exodus 34, verses 5 to 7. And they spake unto Moses, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. And Moses gave commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, Let neither man nor woman make any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing, for the stuff they had was sufficient for all the work to make it, and too much. The followers of Christ are supposed to regard this as their favorite maxim, the greater the sinner, the greater the saint. They are considered also as approving an inference that may be deduced from it, namely that it is advisable to commit some gross crime in order to augment our future piety. We trust, however, that such calumnies, though often affirmed, are not really credited. The least consideration would convince a man that such a sentiment could find no place in a religious mind. But, though we utterly disclaim any such licentious tenets, yea, and utterly abhor them, yet we must say that he who has been forgiven much will love much, and that godly sorrow, in proportion as it exists in the soul, will work indignation and revenge against all our spiritual enemies, and will lead us invariably to bring forth works meet for repentance. This truth is strongly illustrated in the history before us. The whole nation of the Jews had revolted from God and worshipped the golden calf. For this God had threatened them with utter destruction, but upon the intercession of Moses had reversed his decree and had received them again to his favour. Instead of forsaking them utterly, he had even determined to dwell among them as their God, and had ordered a tabernacle to be made for him with everything else which would be wanted for the service they were to present unto him. For the constructing of this he relied on the liberality of his people, and the event proved that his reliance was well placed, and that their sense of the obligations conferred upon them was sufficiently powerful for the occasion. The account given us of their zeal is truly edifying. It will be proper to notice first the object of it. They had lately shown an unhappy zeal in the service of a false god, and now they laboured to evince their gratitude to Jehovah, and to exalt the honour of his name. This desire filled the whole nation, and was the mainspring of those exertions which they now made, and who must not acknowledge this to have been an object worthy their supreme attention? Survey the objects which occupy the minds of men, and to the pursuit of which they willingly devote their wealth and labour, the gratifications of sense, how mean are they in comparison of that which now animated the Jewish people, the attainment of honour, or the acquisition of wealth, how empty are they in comparison of that nobler end which Israel pursued. Theirs was worthy ambition, and might well provoke them all to holy emulation. To have Jehovah resident among them, to provide for him a suitable habitation, to have proper means of access to him, and of communications from him, and finally to possess before their eyes a pledge of his continued care and his eternal love, this was as much beyond the poor objects of common ambition as the contemplations of reason and philosophy exceed the dreams of children. Happy would it be for us if we all formed the same judgment, and were all penetrated with the same desire. Second, the operation. There are two things in their conduct which we cannot fail to notice and admire, namely their liberality and their diligence. No sooner did they know what things would be accepted than they vied with each other in supplying them. Whatever any man possessed that could be applied to the projected structure, he deemed it instantly korban, and without hesitation consecrated it to the service of his God. Their ornaments of whatever kind were stripped off, all, both men and women, being more desirous to beautify the sanctuary of their God than to adorn themselves. Each seemed to think himself rich, not in proportion to what he retained for his own use, but to the supplies he was able to contribute. The poorest among them were as glad to give their wool, their ramskins, or their brass, as the richest were their jewels and their gold. Nor were they less solicitous to work than to supply materials for working. The women engaged in spinning the goat's hair and embroidering the linen, whilst the men were occupied in forming the wood and metals for their respective uses. Those who could teach were as glad to instruct others as others were to receive instruction, and all desired in whatever way they could to advance the work. 
Now, it is in this way that genuine religion always operates. The converts in every age are represented as coming unto God, their silver and their gold with them, and it is characteristic of them all that they are a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Third, the effect. Such was the conduct of all who were wise-hearted and whose spirits made them willing to glorify their God, and the effect was that in a very few days the abundance of the gifts exceeded the occasion for them, and it became necessary to issue through the camp a prohibition against adding anything further to the store. Oh, what might not be done for the honour of God and the benefit of mankind if all exerted themselves according to their ability? How easy would it be to erect places for the worship of God, to provide accommodations for the poor, to administer instruction to the ignorant, consolation to the troubled, relief to the distressed. Such an union of zealous exertions, as we see exhibited on this occasion, would in a great measure drive affliction from the world, and turn into a paradise this veil of tears. Improvement. 1. Let the cause of God be dear unto our souls. We have not, it is true, any such edifice to raise, and therefore may be supposed to have no such call for zeal and diligence, but is there not a spiritual temple which God desires to have erected for him, and wherein he may be glorified? Yea, is not that temple infinitely more dear to him than any which can be formed by human hands? The material tabernacle was only a shadow of that better habitation wherein God delights to dwell. Should not that, then, be an object of our concern? Should not the manifestations of his presence and the establishment of his kingdom in the world call forth our zeal as much as the erection of that fabric in the wilderness did the zeal of Israel? Well, may it shame the world at large that every trifle occupies their minds more than this, and even the people of God themselves have reason to blush that their feelings are so acute in reference to their own interests and honour, and so dull in what regards the honour and interests of their God. 2. Let us cordially and universally cooperate for the advancement of it. It is generally thought that the duty of propagating Christianity pertains to ministers alone, but it is very little that a minister can do without the cooperation of his people, Multitudes will never come to hear him or afford him any opportunities of benefiting their souls, and the greater part even of those who do attend his ministry gain little from it, for want of having the subjects which they hear impressed upon their minds in a way of private instruction. All should contribute according to their ability to advance the salvation of those around them. Masters should take the superintendence of their families and parents of their children. The more enlightened among the people should endeavour to instruct their unenlightened neighbours, the visiting of the sick, the relieving of the needy, the conducting of Sunday schools for the benefit of the poorer classes, these and such like work should be regarded by all, both men and women, as their common province, and followed by all according to their respective abilities. The people of Israel deemed it not so much their duty as their privilege to contribute to the raising of the tabernacle, and this is the light in which we should view our calls to exertion. Do any account it hard to sacrifice somewhat of their time and interest in such a cause? O oh, tell it not in Gath, publish it not in the streets of Ascalon. Let not the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Let us rather unite all of us with willing hearts in the service of our God, and whatever our hand findeth to do, let us do it with all our might. End of Sermon 54. Sermon 55 of Exodus from Hori Homiletiki by Charles Simeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The tabernacle service commenced. Exodus 40, verses 1 and 2. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month shalt thou set up the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation. The beginning of a new year is, not without reason, considered by Christians in general as a fit occasion for more than ordinary attention to religious duties. I say not, indeed, that the generality of Christians actually so employ that hallowed time, for, in fact, the whole season wherein we commemorate the incarnation of our blessed Lord is, by the generality, made rather a time for carnal mirth. But still, this is acknowledged by all to be rather an abuse of our religious privileges than a suitable improvement of them. There is in the minds of all a conscientiousness that to review our past errors with penitence and to prepare for a more diligent performance of our duty in future is the proper employment of that period when we are entering, as it were, upon a new scene of things. In my text, the first day of the first month was appointed by God himself as the time for commencing the services of the tabernacle after the Israelites had abode in the wilderness nearly a whole year. 
Doubtless both Moses and the various artificers had used great diligence to get every vessel ready for the service which it was destined to perform, and great exertion must have been made on the day here spoken of, wherein the tabernacle and all the vessels of it were not only got ready for their destined use, but were employed in the very service for which they had been formed. But the command of Jehovah animated the people on this occasion, and I hope their conduct will encourage us also to prosecute with becoming earnestness the labours which this season calls for at our hands. For the advancement of this blessed object I will set before you, first, the work here assigned to Moses. He was ordered now to set up the tabernacle with everything belonging to it, and to commence the service of it. A pattern of every part of it had been shown to him on Mount Sinai, and according to that pattern had everything been formed. No less than eight times in this one chapter is it said that he did everything as the Lord had commanded him. For all this care, both in relation to the pattern given him and to the execution of it by himself and all under his command, there was, no doubt, a very important reason. The very injunction given him at the time of showing to him the pattern, See thou make all things according to the pattern shown to thee in the mount, strongly marked that, in the divine mind, there was some very important end to be accomplished by it. What that end was, we are informed in the epistle to the Hebrews, the tabernacle itself and all its vessels were intended to be an example and shadow of heavenly things, that is, of the things revealed to us under the Christian dispensation. In a word, the law and its ordinances were intended to give a just representation of the gospel and its mysteries, and the two were to accord with each other, in every the minutest part, even as an impression with the seal by which it was made. Behold then, here was the work assigned to Moses, namely to give to the Jewish people such an exhibition of the gospel and its mysteries, as should suffice for them under that shadowy dispensation, and prepare them for that fuller manifestation which should be vouchsafed to the church by the ministry of Christ and of his holy apostles. The tabernacle itself was a representation of Christ, in whom dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and who in his incarnate state dwelt, tabernacled amongst us. The priests, the altar, and the sacrifices shadowed him forth as the great high priest, through whom alone we can come to God, and who, being himself the altar that sanctified the gift, offered himself a sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, even an offering and a sacrifice to God of a sweet-smelling savour. The altar of incense also designated that same divine saviour as ever living to make intercession for us. The candlestick also and the table of showbread represented him as the light of the world, and as the bread of life, of which whosoever eats shall live for ever. The lavers too represented him as the fountain open for sin, in which every one who washeth is cleansed from all sin. The same may be said of every the minutest vessel in the sanctuary. They all shadowed forth the Lord Jesus in some part of his mediatorial office. But I must by no means omit to mention the ark, in which the tables of the law were placed, and which was covered by the mercy seat of precisely the same dimensions, and which represented him as fulfilling the law for us, and as obtaining mercy for all who should come to God by him. Now all of these, whether the vessels or the persons who officiated in the use of them, were anointed with oil to show that even Christ himself, being anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows, had the Spirit given to him without measure for the performance of his work, and that no person or service can ever be acceptable to God, unless it be sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Let us next turn our attention to, second, the corresponding work that is now called for at our hands. We are now called, every one of us, one to realize in our minds the things here shadowed forth. The wonders of redemption should occupy our attention every day, but on this day especially should we be coming to God in that new and living way which Christ has opened for us through the veil. We should go to the Lord Jesus Christ as our sacrifice, and as the altar that sanctifies that sacrifice, and as the priest that offers it. Under all the characters that have been before contemplated concerning him, we should apply to him, receiving everything out of his fullness. From day to day, as long as the Jewish polity existed, were the various sacrifices and services of the Mosaic ritual renewed, and as long as the world shall stand, must we look to Jesus as here shadowed forth, feeding on him as our bread, washing in him as our lover, and living altogether by faith on him. Would to God that every one of you would this very day begin these services, if you have hitherto been strangers to them, or prosecute them with redoubled ardour, if you have already entered on this life of faith. Two, to get them spiritually wrought within our own souls. We have said that Christ was mystically shadowed forth in all the services of that day, 
And this is true, but it is also true that the life of God in our own souls was spiritually represented. Yes, brethren, we are temples of the Holy Ghost, and God will come down and dwell in us. Yea, Christ will dwell in our hearts by faith, and in us are the sacrifices of prayer and praise to be offered to him continually. In truth, we ourselves are to be living sacrifices to him, and as an holy priesthood, we are to be offering ourselves to him. Every faculty of our souls is to be sanctified to his service by the Holy Spirit, lightened by his light and nourished by his grace. We are, in fact, to be lights in this dark world and witnesses for Jehovah that he alone is God. My dear brethren, this conformity to Christ is at once our duty and our privilege, and to grow up into him in all things as our living head is the work of every day throughout our whole lives. Now then, I call you to commence this work, if it be not yet begun, or to proceed in it with augmented ardour, if, through the grace of God, it be already begun in your souls. And for your encouragement, I will venture to affirm that the tokens of God's approbation, which were vouchsafed to Moses, shall as really, if not so sensibly, be renewed to you, for the glory of the Lord shall fill your souls, and the most signal manifestations of his love shall abide with you, both in this world and in the world to come. And now I appeal to you whether this will not be a good employment for the season on which we have just entered. Who does not regret that he has lost so much time already? Moses, considering how many months had been consumed in the wilderness before he began his work, could not have well completed it before. But who among you might not have begun long before, and been now both serving and enjoying God in a tenfold greater degree, if he had duly improved his time and prosecuted his work with unremitting care? Well, let it then be your endeavour now to redeem the time, that if this be the destined period, that is to put an end to your earthly existence, you may enter with joy into the presence of your Lord, and be forever happy in the bosom of your God. End of Sermon 55《Sermon 56 of Exodus from Hori Homiletici by Charles Simeon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Erecting of the Tabernacle, Exodus 40, verses 33 and 34. So Moses finished the work. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. An union of many hands and much zeal must of necessity expedite any work that is undertaken. So it proved in the constructing of the tabernacle, the whole of which, notwithstanding the exquisite skill and workmanship with which every part of it was formed, was, in about the space of seven months, completely finished, so as to be capable of being all erected and brought into use in one single day. Such activity could not but be highly pleasing to God, in whose service it was employed. Accordingly, we find that he most immediately testified his approbation of it, by a most astonishing act of condescension and grace, that we may see this subject in its true light, let us inquire into, first, the work here referred to. This was the constructing of the tabernacle, a work of singular excellency and importance, whether it be considered in itself or in its typical design. Let us view it, one in itself. It will be proper to notice briefly its form. There was a court, about sixty yards long and thirty broad, enclosed by linen curtains, suspended about nine feet high on brazen pillars. Within that, at the west end of it, was a structure, about eighteen yards long, and six broad, made with boards of shittim wood, covered with gold, and fastened together by bars of the same materials. The boards were forty-eight in number, fixed in ninety-six sockets of silver, each of them about a hundred points weight. The whole was covered first with curtains of fine embroidered linen, and then with three other coverings, one of goat's hair, another of ram skins dyed red, and another of badger skins. This structure was divided into two apartments called the Holy Place and the Holy of Holies, the former being about twelve yards by six, and the latter six yards square, and as many high. The entrance to each of these was from the east, as was that of the outward court also, each leading to the other through a veil of embroidered linen. The furniture of the whole was quite appropriate. In the outer court, to which all clean Hebrews and proselytes had access, was the brazen altar on which the sacrifices were offered, and the brazen laver in which the priests and Levites were to purify themselves. In the holy place into which the priests were admitted was the candlestick, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense. In the holy of holies, where the high priest alone entered, and that only on one day in the year, 
was the ark covered by the mercy seat, on which abode the Shekinah, the bright cloud, the symbol of the deity, between cherubim. In the ark the tables of the law were deposited, and at a subsequent period Aaron's rod that budded, and the golden pot that had the manna, were laid up before it. We need not enter minutely into these things, it will be more instructive, after taking this summary view of the whole, to notice it, too, in its typical design. In interpreting the types we must bear in mind that the greater part of them had reference to Christ in one view, and to his church and people in another view. This was particularly the case with respect to the tabernacle. It typified, in the first place, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord himself, speaking of his own body, says, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. And in the epistle to the Hebrews his body is represented as that more perfect tabernacle in which he ministered, and which was not made with hands, as the other was, but by the immediate agency of the Holy Ghost. The correspondence between the two is obvious, for in him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and through his atoning sacrifice and sanctifying grace and prevailing intercession, we all are brought into a state of acceptance with God. On the other hand, as there was no way to the mercy seat but through the holy place, so no man can now come unto the Father but by him. It further typified the church, which, though mean without, is all glorious within. In that alone is any acceptable sacrifice offered unto God. In that alone are the sanctifying operations of the Spirit experienced. In that alone is the bread of life administered, or the light of truth exhibited. In that alone does God manifest His glory, or communicate His saving benefits. Hence the beloved Apostle, speaking of the church in the latter days, says, The tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself shall be with them, and be their God. Once more it typifies heaven also. Remarkable is the language of the Apostle who says, Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. There, not the symbol of the deity, but all the glory of the Godhead is unveiled. There, the sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving ascend up with a sweet odour unto God continually. There, the illumination, the nourishment, the purity of every soul is complete. No veil obstructs the view or forbids the access of any individual. The beatific vision is vouchsafed to all, and the full fruition of their God is the portion of all the saints. If we judged only from the minuteness of the orders which God gave respecting this work, we should conceive highly of its importance, but still more shall we see it if we consider, second, the testimony of his approbation with which God honoured it. We must bear in mind that Israel had sinned a grievous sin, that at the intercession of Moses God had turned away from his holy indignation and promised to continue with them as their God. In token of his reconciliation he ordered this tabernacle to be made for him, and the very day it was erected, he came down visibly to take possession of it as his peculiar residence, and so filled it with his glory that Moses himself could no longer stand to minister there. Now, whilst this testified his approbation of their work and of those who had been engaged in it, it showed to all future generations that he will return to those in love and mercy who return to him in a way of penitence and active obedience. In this view, we are led to consider this event not as relating to the Israelites merely, but as speaking to us. Where is the nation, where the church, where the individual, who has not given just occasion to the Lord to shut up his loving-kindness in displeasure? Yet where is there to be found in the annals of the world one single instance wherein God has turned a deaf ear to the supplications of a real penitent? Instances to the contrary are without number, and God, as in the history before us, has seemed ambitious, as it were, to make his grace abound, not only where sin had abounded, but, I had almost said, in proportion as sin had abounded, we must be careful not to limit the Holy One of Israel, whose ways and thoughts are as far above ours as the heavens are above the earth. We are apt to forget that he is the same God now as he was in the days of old, but he changeth not, and if his manifestations be less visible than formerly, they are not a whit less real or less gracious. Application. The day on which this work was finished was the first day of the year. What a blessed commencement was it of the new year! How sweet must have been the retrospect to all who had been engaged in the work when they saw that they had not spent the preceding year in vain. Each could call to mind some sacrifices which he had made for God, or some exertions used in his service, and they would enter on the year with a determined purpose to serve and honour God more than they had ever yet done. Beloved brethren, is it so with you? 
Have you in your consciences an evidence that you have lived for God and made it a principal object of your life to serve and honour Him? But, however the past year may have been spent, bethink yourselves now what work you have to do for Him, and how you may perfect it with expedition and care. And oh, that we may speedily have such a day amongst us as the Israelites enjoyed, all of us presenting to Him our souls and bodies for His habitation, and receiving from Him undoubted tokens of His favourable regard. End of Sermon 56 End of Exodus from Hori Homiletiki by Charles Simeon